Hey everybody, welcome to Surface Level, creating a community where Black and queer folks are fearless in thought and curious at heart. I'm one of your hosts, Jordan, and today, Tony Damon and I are discussing the intersection of the Black and Asian communities. What role has media played in society's perception of Asian Americans? What solutions do we think will help create safer environments for Black and Asian communities? This is Stop Blasian Hate. All right, so we got quite the conversation in store for us today. So I feel like we should just jump straight into a game. Sure. All right, let's do it. Let's just jump straight in, right? Let's do it. (laughs) I don't think there's any surprise that um, one thing that Black and Asian communities share is misrepresentation or underrepresentation in media. So where's this game going? So I thought <laughs> I thought it would be fun to bring some awareness to some Blasian pop icons mm-hmm. through okay. a game of trivia. Oh boy! <laughs> okay, well, I'm all, I'm all about awareness, as we know. She's about to get me back. But I'm l- I'm less about trivia because I'm terrible, <laughs> so I'll probably get all of these wrong. But that's my track record. Honestly, so. it's just go in saying that you're going to lose it all, and then if you win one. You win. Right. I'll, I'll come out. <laughs> you win. <laughs> I'll, I'll come out better than I ever thought I would do. Exactly. So, all right. So, Kamora Lee Simmons of Japanese and African American descent launched the ultra successful fashion brand Baby Fat. The logo includes which animal? A cat or a fox? Tony, <laughs> Tomorrow, why you look at me? Tony want to you're, talk. You're the fashion girl. <laughs> <laughs> he knows. That's why he wants you to answer first. He don't, he don't know. <laughs> he wants to follow my answer. Otherwise, he would have said it. I, that's, I know this girl. I'm on to her. It's a cat. It's like a little feline. It's, like, it's a cat. Moment. Okay. That was just to, you know, that is, yes, you're correct. It, it that was just to... like, no, it's actually a fox. And like, <laughs> <laughs> not this. That I was, was like, that's been a fox. That was time. supposed to be a trick <laughs> question, but y'all didn't fall for it. You know, I was trying to go for something with like a similar silhouette. Mm-hmm. All right. Khalees of Chinese, African American, and Puerto Rican descent released her smash hit Milkshake mm-hmm. in 2003. Who was the song originally written for? Oh. Was it Britney <laughs> Spears or Jennifer Lopez? Britney Spears. Oh, I'm going to guess Britney Spears. <laughs> they, they will literally write Britney Spears any Anything. song and it'll become <laughs> pop. I thought that was going to be a curveball. It was absolutely Britney Spears. I cannot. <laughs> Britney Spears. I can't watch because it's not a song for like choreography. So I cannot imagine J-Lo doing Milkshake. I mean, ah! she would have done it differently. It would have been a different song. It would have been a different song. There would have been a whole dance routine to go with it. It would have been iconic as well. But like, I can hear Britney's voice in my I head. I can hear Britney Spears singing Milkshake. Yeah. La, 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 <laughs> la, 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 um, Naomi Osaka of Japanese and Haitian descent won her first Grand Slam at the U.S. Open at what age? Is it 20 or 18? 18. I'm always going to guess the younger age because that's how tennis runs. 20! So, she was 20. Oh, I yeah. thought she was like 16. She was 20 when she won her first gla- um, Grand Slam at wow. the U.S. Open. And it was, uh, she defeated Serena Williams in that. Mm-hmm. I remember that. And, it's giving, and 20 is giving like, you're old already in tennis. <laughs> right? <laughs> After watching that um, King Richard movie, I was just mm-hmm. like, oh, this is... I never saw, like, you know, the, the background stories of, like, yeah. training these mm-hmm. athletes. Um, all right. Neo of Chinese and African-American <laughs> descent. Now, you learn something new every day. <laughs> what? <laughs> I didn't know. I yeah. Didn't know. Yeah, you know. <laughs> it's, it's That's what we talk about when we say misrepresentation or underrepresentation. <laughs> right. Awareness. The, mo- <laughs> the more you know. Um, so, Neo, a Chinese and African-American descent, wrote some of music's biggest hits. Which of his written songs were released first? Which one was released first? Okay. Was it Irreplaceable by Beyonce or Take a Bow by Rihanna? Irreplaceable. I would, I don't know. Ugh. What is irreplaceable oh, on B Day? Irreplaceable was on B Day, mm-hmm. and Take a Bow was. I feel like Take a Bow. Take was, a Bow's on the one where she got that white dress on. I'm gonna just say Take a Bow, um, because it just seems like <laughs> <laughs> it just seems like Jordan is smiling. I can't help it. He has a terrible poker face. <laughs> <laughs> we can't go to a, a casino with you. We would lose. I don't. I don't gamble, so Absolutely. I would never not. do it. I don't gamble. 
I don't gamble. Well, if I was a betting man, I wouldn't bet on you. Then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't bet on you either because you're wrong. Well, um, I just so took a guess. reading each other. We, this is about the community this, this episode. You're right. You're right. I just thought that people, we wouldn't know because Irreplaceable came out in 2006. Take a Bow came out in 2007. That was a yeah. really transformational year for us. Irreplaceable is a song that I Girl, it was know. Like 15 years ago. I don't about. remember exactly what song you came know, out. You know what came out freshman year. Seven. You know what songs came out freshman <laughs> year of college. Child. Okay. Last one. Naomi Campbell, of Chinese and Jamaican descent, is one of the world's most renowned supermodels. And she landed her first French Vogue cover in, at, in what year? 1988 sure. or 1996? Naomi Campbell? Naomi Campbell. I'm going to go with 96. I'm just going to go with the opposite because why not? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tony, you, you redeemed yourself. It was 1988. <laughs> and that was her first French Vogue cover. Cute. Yeah. I was waiting for a Karuchi question. Uh, oh. Well, you know, <laughs> Karuchi I, kept it to, I kept it to pop icons. Or, um, Janae Aiko. Janae Aiko. Yeah. I'm very surprised you didn't give us a Janae Aiko question. Yeah, because... We, you know, we love Janae around here. We do love Janae. I don't like Janae. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. I enjoy her a lot. I don't dislike her as a human. I, I, I'm not a fan You don't of live music. for the bops. That's okay. Mm -hmm. I don't need her whispering at me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I think it's a good time to introduce our guest. <laughs> and in the spirit of building community, which is what we strive for, and sharing perspectives outside of our own, we wanted to bring some voices to the table that were representative of the Asian American community but also have diverse backgrounds. And actually one of today's guests um, is one of Damon's friends. <laughs> and so he played a big role in helping us to curate this moment. And so we really appreciate that. Uh, so I'm gonna briefly introduce our guests and I'm gonna also share their ethnic backgrounds because we really feel like it's important um, to share that to provide some context uh, for the discussion that we're going to have. And then later on, we'll circle back and let you know exactly how to find each of these individuals that we speak to today so that you can learn more about them. So first, we have Jonathan Gibbs, who's a content creator and storyteller of Black and Filipino descent. Next, we have Will Lexham, who's an artist and community organizer of Chinese American descent. And lastly, we have Stephen Wakabayashi, creative director and equity leader of Taiwanese and Japanese descent. So today, we welcome you all to our surface level family. Welcome. Hey guys. Hey. Let's Hi. go. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we're going to start right here, okay? Because our catchphrase slash slogan, if you will, for the podcast is stay curious. And so we believe that it's important to stay curious about the world around you and the people who inhabit it. And also just to constantly remain a student and learning and soaking up experiences. So we want to know from you all, what are you curious about? So let's start with Jonathan. Let's start with you. Uh, I'm going to be very transparent about my curiosity right now. I am wondering what... Jordan Peele's next film is going to be like no <laughs> about. There's no information. And at the same time, I'm also wanting to know what Bong Joon Ho is doing. If you haven't seen Parasite and or any of his other works, um, you need to check it out. Uh, but these are the things that I'm curious about right now as I get more into filmmaking and storytelling in 2022. That's true curiosity. Right. And, and I, I, I love that. Very specific <laughs> and just like of the moment. Uh, Will, how about you? What are you What are you curious about? Um, I'm curious about how do we like break the tribalism uh, in our society. You know, I think uh, a lot of people are just like stuck in echo chambers, and like this is what uh, is driving people apart from each other and um, not allowing people to hear each other, and uh, it's it's uh, causing a lot of the issues that we have uh s socially in our country nice a lot of food for thought there uh steven let's go to you what do you think what are you curious about what's on your mind what is on my mind um coming out of 2021 feeling a lot of exhaustion <laughs> fatigue <laughs> and uh, i mean just speaking for myself here just a lot of curiosity in terms of how to replenish that energy how to revitalize myself my spirit my soul and 
figuring out ways to have a more uh, balanced 2022, figuring out how we can make it more sustainable. Yeah, that sounds, I think a lot of us can agree with that yeah. about where we are and how we're feeling and the fatigue of it all. I mean, just when you think about coronavirus and, and all of that good stuff is like, yeah, not good stuff, but bad stuff. But we're tired of that. And just in general, I think a lot of us are, you want to take a I'm tired. A, a long nap without having to die right now? I want to take a long nap. <laughs> and, and Right, guys? Yeah, I would love There's to. There's a hotline. <laughs> I don't know. I don't need that hotline. I don't I think. I want to go right, right up to death, but not over. <laughs> I want to go right up to <laughs> don't death. Don't take me over, Jesus. Don't take me over. <laughs> but let's let's get into our, our real first question for you guys. Um, and we want to talk about how the model minority stereotype in the world, or at least here in the country, in, in America, portrays Asian Americans as smart, wealthy, hardworking, docile, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we want to know how these stereotypes have affected your relationship with white Americans versus other minority groups. Stephen, let's start with you. Yeah, it's uh, been quite a journey for myself. And I think the hardest part about the model minority complex is this association of identity based on your work and what you put out. And as myself, um, creating projects, initiatives, organizations, I have a lot of decades of work to undo this uh, association of output. Uh, based on my identity and self-worth. And I think uh, just speaking for at least myself and my immediate communities um, it is redefining what that is, redefining what it means to be Asian and to break away uh, from this mold as a part of identifying with our self-worth. Um, that to be Asian, you don't have to fit <laughs> within this particular mold. Um, but unfortunately, I think <laughs> for many of us, for many years, it's been ingrained as a part of uh, how we've been raised, especially here in America, as well as our families and how they've been raised as well and what we've been taught growing up. Yes, thank you for sharing that. Um, Jonathan, what, what's your take? What do you, how would you answer that question? Mm, I would have to say, uh, you know, thinking about what the minority the model minority complex or myth or uh, fortress or whatever you want to call it is. Um, for me, it's breaking the stereotype or the assumption of what people think Asian is, first of all, um, being black and Asian mixed or black and Filipino more specifically mixed, which is part of Asia. <clears throat> I've, it's really hard. It's been really hard for me, thanks to that uh, myth, to even identify or take part in conversations that are Asian in nature, uh, not just because Asians look at me and are like, who is this guy? Like, why is he here? But also because white folks and black folks and everybody else are like, is he identifying as Asian? Why is that? And it's hmm. like, that is my identity. Like, that's who I am as well. There's a lot of complexities between various different um, groups, whether it's black folks who look at me or whether it's white folks on the outside looking at me and being like, what's going on there? Or I have to pause because the police, I don't know if you can hear that, sorry. It's okay. Crown Heights, y'all. Um, <laughs> or, uh, you know, it, it, it's just, it's really frustrating for me because I have to work extra hard to get into these spaces to speak up for multiple communities. And, um, uh, it's it, this there's this wall and it's it's really hard to get over yeah and you really hit on something important because a lot of people associate you with how you look and they say oh you mm -hmm. you can't be that because you you you, you don't look like it right mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that's problematic will what about what about you what's your take what how do you how would you answer that question Man, fuck the model minority myth. That's what I'm going to say about it. Uh, no, it it's, um, it's just a, it's a tool that's used uh, to gaslight 
the problems of the Asian American community, the things that we face, and also used to pit us against each other, uh, against other minority groups as, uh, oh, okay, they can pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Uh, and, and we have in many ways, but, you know, the Asian American community is not like monolithic at all. It's incredibly diverse. Um, you know, in New York City, 25% uh, of the Asian American community uh, lives under the poverty line. You know, it's the uh, uh, most uh, compared to any other ethnic group in uh, the city. And um, we have just so many different experiences. Some, some Asians have been here for generations. Uh, some have, you know, are recent immigrants. And just so many different points of entry from so many different countries, from so many different languages and cultures and religious beliefs and political beliefs uh, that you can't really, uh, you know, give a real identity to Asian Americans. And especially in this country where we're like everything is based on race. And the only time you really talk about race is when it pertains to white folks or black folks. And um there's no room for really anyone else and no room for our own identity uh, leaving either uh, us to be either like white adjacent or black adjacent. Yeah, I love that you brought that up because people tend to over oversimplify the conversation as it pertains to like race in America. Um, yeah. Damon, I yeah. see your, your... No, it was interesting because you have a comment. that trope is kind of used as this wedge issue specifically in politics. Um, so for instance, the affirmative action case with Harvard was like a conservative mm. think tank using Asian Americans as the plaintiffs for the case. And then a lot of the press and the headlines around it was, quote, Asian people don't support affirmative action, which was false. And I think that it, like I was reading, researching before this, um, and there was a, <clears throat> in the Asian American voter survey, around 70% of Asian Americans support affirmative action with 16% opposing it. And the lowest group were Chinese Americans, where if even it was still a majority of 56% of the people supporting affirmative action. Mm -hmm. And I think when you get into these ideas of the model minority or the quote plaintiff of people that don't want affirmative action, it represents a very small voice within a community. And then as a black person, we get into conversations and it's like, oh, well, it isn't that hard for you or mm -hmm. you aren't going through what we're going through and it creates this dissonance between groups that really should be working together. Right. Mm -hmm. Because in the same instance, you could find a very small minority of black people that also don't support affirmative action. Absolutely. You, you, if you give Clarence Thomas the mic <laughs> and he has a very large mic on he the does. Supreme Court. Absolutely. Like it would be the same thing and saying, well, that represents all black people. And that can and I that say something? Not the, the answer is no. Absolutely. Sure, Jonathan. Jonathan. No, I just want to say, like, think of when uh, the model minority myth came up. What, like, when in history? That's the mid 20th century. This is after Black folks rallied together and did the civil rights um, acts that they did, the, the whole movement of civil rights. So, Black folks had just owned, you know, racist white supremacists in front of the whole world. And so now, you know, the, whites had to come up with something. It had to be the next step and say, oh, well, why don't we introduce these other people? And then we'll say, you know, oh, well, they're doing so well. Mm -hmm. Why are you all so bad at just being good citizens? These are mm -hmm. the model minorities. You hmm. need to be more like them. It's like when you have brothers or sisters and your parents say, well, why can't you just be good like your sister? You know, stuff like that. It's that same tactic and it's very yeah. insidious. Yeah, I, that was something that... <clears throat> that came to the top for me as well is that um white supremacy took you know sort of stereotypes that were placed on asian americans of being hard working of being overachievers and then took that to sort of throw into black people's face mm -hmm. because of the stereotype of being lazy and so it creates this feud between two communities who should be joining together to demand's point to dismantle the white supremacy mm -hmm. and it's it's an old tactic and it happens all the time, as recent as last year. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. well, a lot of this conversation is rooted in representation. And on this podcast, we speak a lot about the value of representation. And a large issue for Asian Americans is has to deal with the erasure of the Asian American community from mainstream American pop culture. We want to know from you guys. How did this affect how you saw yourself growing up? Let's start with you, Will. 
Um, I mean, let's take it to the beginning of your segment. You know, who knew that Naomi Campbell was half Chinese <laughs> and Neo was half Chinese? What the hell? I mean, <laughs> it, like it, it really messes with you because uh, I'm thinking about like when I grew up and who was like the you know I was raised on TV and who was like the pop icon during that time. It was definitely Zach Morris, Paul Glossier from uh, Saved by the Bell, right? <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Who played Zach Morris, right? And and I'm like, you know, it's this blonde, you know, haired white kid or whatever, right? And only until like, what was it, like a few years ago, I find out that he was half Indonesian. Oh, what the really? fuck? Right? Yeah, he's half right. Indonesian. Mind blown, mind blown. Mm -hmm. But there are so many of these like, you know, Asian or half Asian uh, folks like Superman uh, was <laughs> half Asian. Uh, there was a bunch of folks. And... But if we only knew, you mm -hmm. know, uh, it would have done mm -hmm. all, a whole lot of a difference in, I think, how I saw myself uh, growing up in, you know, navigating, you know, grade school, high school, college, et cetera. Yeah, I think that's that's a great point, you know. Um, but, Stephen, let's get your take on it. Hmm. I mean, not seeing people like myself definitely did a toll on just my capacity to even envision for myself in the future. And I want to talk specifically about queer Asian representation. Growing mm -hmm. up, um, watching any queer film or TV show, right? There weren't any queer BIPOC in general represented <laughs> in anything. Right. And I think that plays a large effect also in the way that we individually see the way that we have the capacity to love or even be loved and growing up i think and, and we're starting to see it now and ironically a lot more of queer asian representation in media is spearheaded by a lot of uh countries over in the uh, east with asia southeast asia and um i think right now we're still we're still at the precipice of representation in terms of trying to overcome right these monoliths that have been created because we were lacking so much representation before and so um now going outside of the queer representation right we had movies such as crazy rich asians mm -hmm. um coming out that put asians a full asian cast in the forefront but unfortunately with that right creating a monolith that now Asians are rich, successful, all these things. And I think what I would love to see moving into the future is not just representation, uh, just having an Asian filling a role, but having more diverse characteristics, right? Mm -hmm. uh, spanning across all walks of life. Um, and until we have that, I think us as a community and industry, we have a lot more work to do to really show representation uh, equally in pop media. Right, and yeah. exactly what you're talking about, Stephen, is exactly why we started this podcast, is because there we're, we are in a monolith and there's mm -hmm. so many different variations of how we show up in the world. And so it's important to be able to see all of those variations because different people who identify with that variation will see it and say like, oh, I can do that thing. Mm -hmm. They can really identify and, you know, have a moment of reflection and say like, there are possibilities for me. It's not all just this thing that society sees or deems as what, you know. Success is. What, is, what success is right. and what the options are out there. Uh, Jonathan, I know you're chomping at the bit. <laughs> what, what do you have to say about this topic? Oh, um, I'm glad that you mentioned the reason why you started this podcast, because it is a black, gay, queer podcast, and you felt like that wasn't being represented. So on my black side, I look and I see like, oh, you've got your Viola Davises, you've got your Halle Berry's, you've got your Tyler Perry's, you've got your Oprah's, and I'm naming all of these people to say that they are, they represent a range within the black community that has been recognized, but we still have mm -hmm. a long way to go. Now take that progress that we've got in the media and now compare that to Asian, which Stephen just mentioned Crazy Rich Asians. Before that, it was what? Maybe Memoirs of a Geisha. And before that, maybe the Joy Luck Club in 1991. 
um, with constant movies of like Jackie Chan and this and that and the other that the American audience got to see. And then that's kind of what they had in their mind of what, quote, Asian was. <sighs> Crazy Rich Asians comes out uh, now leaning over toward the Asian side of my identity. And one of the number one critiques that we had there was, oh, well, why are all the Filipinos in this movie the butlers? or like the servants of the Chinese people. See, like Asia, mm -hmm. quote unquote, has an entire interconnected, all the countries have something going on with each other. They don't like each other or they do like each other. Some, this person did that, it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> We're at like season 20,000 of Asia. So for me, <laughs> representing for Filipino, you know, I'm always looking for those chances. I'm looking for folks to excel. You know, I, I, I'm not quite there <laughs> with Issa Rae's, like, I'm rooting for everyone Black. I'm rooting for everyone Filipino because it's a range and there are some problematic ass Filipinos. Not going <laughs> to name any. But, um, you know, just today, this is a deep cut for your listeners. If anybody is a gamer out there and plays the game Valorant, they announced a new character who is Filipina. And when I watched the trailer for her character and she said, Hoy! I was like, holy shit, like there is someone that is Filipino and wow, I'm happy for you. I'm happy for us. Mm -hmm. So um, it's weird to like live in this dichotomy of like, we have representation, AKA like the black side is like, we have representation, but there's still so much work to do to treat us right. And then also be a part of a community that has no representation. Mm -hmm. And every, when you even see one mention of a Filipino, it's like, holy shit, there we are. You know, yeah. so yeah. yeah, well, shout out to the surface level gamers out there. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's a that's a good point that you um that you point out, Jonathan, because I read an article that came out um, from NPR last year, and they were referencing a study where forty two percent of the people surveyed um, could not name one Asian American pop star or just a notable Asian American person, a public figure. Um, and then that was the number one answer was none. Sec the second answer was Jack um, Jackie Chan. Um, so yes, it's a huge issue with um, underrepresentation slash minimal or no representation at times. And there was also a proprietary research study that came out from Nickelodeon that talks about how kids are sort of reacting to representation and how at the young age of preschool age, they start to form ideals and self-esteem about their race and their culture based on what they see or what they don't see on TV. So um, Jonathan, I want to I want to come back to you because, you know, you, you mentioned it, but you have an international experience, intersectional experience of being both Filipino and black. And I want to just know from your experience, um, how has that how has that experience affected you both, you know, being in Asian spaces, um, as well as being in black spaces? I want to say first that, um, you know, when I was nine years old, I left my mom's house and moved in with my dad. And even that first nine years of life, it was a very, even though my mom, my stepdad was married to a black man. And so it was a black man in the house and then a Filipina in the house. Um, it was still a very quote, Asian upbringing or a Filipino upbringing. And it was a culture shock to move in with my dad who was black. And, you know, the first thing that he did was this was his way of trying to educate me. He made me watch the color purple. <laughs> I know that's right. <laughs> I was like, okay. And then, but, but from there, like we left California, we moved to Mississippi where everything is just black and white. And during my time in junior high and high school, it was just black and white. And then toward the end of high school, it was Mexican. So like people were moving in. Um, so I had to identify with one of those very quickly and it was black. So from nine years old to post-college, because I went to an HBCU as well, Rust College, um, out of uh, Holly Springs, Mississippi, um, I was just black. Like I, hmm. and, and people would ask like, are you mixed with something? And I'm like, yeah, Filipino, but I never really got into it past that. It was only until I moved to New York City where I was around a much more diverse population, which included Asian people, that I started, le forcibly leaning into putting myself into uh, conversations because it is my right as someone who is Filipino. So I do suffer a lot of imposter syndrome at the time, mm -hmm. um, but you know, this is just it. And, and now it's kind of flipped uh, where folks are like, you ain't black. 
And I'm like, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm like I'm, yo, well, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, shout, shout, shout out to um, one of our service level games called You Ain't Black. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, moving on, we're going to open this question up, I guess kind of to the broader group. Um, but one in the last year, obviously, there have been many conversations, um, some productive, some not, um, around Black Lives Matter, around Stop Asian Hate, um, in both communities, around how we're living in America and how we can um, move forward. Um, so what um, are the, the people in this group thinking some of the best ideas and solutions are to create safe, pl- safe environments for Black and Asian communities? Um, Will, let's start with you. Yeah. <clears throat> um, there's, I think, a lot of echo chambers that kind of um, push a particular narrative about our communities against each other. Mm. And, um, and I think it's very easy, you know, when you see on certain Asian pages, you can see a lot of like anti-black sentiment. And then when you see on uh, a bunch of black, black pages, you see a lot of anti-Asian sentiment when, you know, uh, there are those posts. And uh, I think the best thing that we can do is not like try to fight and, you know, try to correct everyone, but then to really just showcase the love between our communities. There's a lot of like, uh, cooperation, community building, um, a lot of like incredible friendships and support that we have amongst each other uh, that needs to be shown and showcased. So I think if we can somehow trick the algorithms to show more of that, uh, that would be a lot more helpful. Thank you. Tony? Oh, so... we <laughs> <laughs> I... to the group. Yeah, welcome me back to the group. I wasn't <laughs> I wasn't prepared to go next, but I'm prepared. I'm always prepared. <laughs> um, for me, what I think is important is policy. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've got to ensure that we're knocking down the doors of our policymakers in the country about the issues that really concern us. Because what I'm learning, and as as we've done this podcast and through like just being more involved and more aware, I'm seeing how important it is to knock on those doors because until it's policy we're really grasping at straws Mm -hmm. and although every little bit counts it's like until they sign that bill into a law Mm -hmm. it doesn't matter Mm -hmm. almost but i think the fight and 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 you know being an activist and being out there like everyone on this call today and is is an activist and i think everyone's doing their little part to add up to the the sum the greater sum of it all so we've mm-hmm. got to keep you know knocking down those doors and snatching the wigs off of <laughs> the policy makers <laughs> in this country and uh, let's go to steven <laughs> um what came to mind was just shantae you stay policy um <laughs> <laughs> oh shout out to rupaul's drag race new season <laughs> this week um yeah I, I just to add on to what everyone has been speaking about myself i've been in the activism space being vocal for the early part when all this stuff was happening but have transitioned over the past year into creating safe spaces through healing solidarity uh through meditation sitting together and so Uh, I think that was a big lesson coming out of 2021 along the lines of this feeling of exhaustion was the need for us to create spaces that maybe weren't about taking action, but maybe just healing, resting ourselves. And I want to give a shout out to this Instagram account that has been really, really monumental in shifting a lot of the conversation, the Nat Ministry, the stuff that they produce just absolutely beautiful in terms of using rest as a form of resistance and so definitely as a part of just even going back up to model minority complexes we as BIPOC communities fall into that trap when all we do is uh, just active work and when we're not reclaiming our time or space just to be in our skin just to rest and just to live uh, we 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 surrender ourselves to the systems of inequity um, around us, and so I think 
that's really shifted a lot of my way of thinking about activism really as this two-part fold, one part really in terms of having a voice, standing up, advocating for policy changes, shifting our narratives and environments. And then the second part, how do we nourish the people actively doing that work? Love that. Absolutely. Jordan? Um, <clears throat> this is kind of difficult for me just because I feel like I feel like I would love to see Black and Asian American communities unite and not allow sort of the division to happen to us. Mm -hmm. I think that last year specifically, um, you know, there were conversations um, that were making headlines about Asian Americans um, wanting more policing. And then I think that there were, you know, conversations about Black Americans wanting less. And I think that we have to understand that what we have in common is that we are both experiencing racial injustice. That's at the core. Um, and even though maybe a portion of Asian Americans want more policing because they want protection for their loved ones so that they're not assaulted in the street by civilians, um, we need to also understand that Black Americans have a very toxic and violent history um, with the police force and with mass incarceration. So I think not allowing those sort of stances to divide us and make us feel like we're the enemy and sort of stay focused on the fact that we're all just looking for justice and equality and that it should really all be rooted, like I said earlier in the episode, um, about dismantling white supremacy and racial injustice. Well, that's all part of hey, the system, right? That yeah. they pit us minority groups against each other so that we kind of take each other out for, per se. Right. right. Mm -hmm. I think we had hey, a... Jordan, like, uh, I think our communities are not like monoliths, right? Like, I think there are um, a lot of Asians who are uh, abolitionists and who are, you know, fighting to, uh, uh, what is it, uh, break down the uh, systems of oppression, uh, yeah. especially when it comes to police. And there's also like black folks who are in like, neighborhoods that are, have a lot of crime that want more policing too correct uh you know there's a lot of like so many, there's what i just sort of stat like i think eight out of like the 10 shootings in philadelphia go unsolved you know like they don't even know to have a suspect you know it's like it's hard you know and but at the same time they also have so much money and resources like why are you not doing your job so um it's it's very nuanced there's there's just so many like uh factors into why you know someone from a community would support or not support and and it's like it's across the board absolutely will and i think that that's the point you know is understanding that um people have their reasons and more often than not it's because they're looking for they're looking for justice and i think that if we sort of focus on that sentiment rather than the headlines that are being published by divisive media outlets then we will be more successful in the end yeah I think for me, it always has come back to community and no one's going to do for you what we need to do for ourselves. And, and, and I don't mean that in a, like, we always, um, to Steven's point, like we're always on the front lines, doing all the work, being crazy, stressing ourselves out, exhausting ourselves. Right. Um, but I think it's about recognizing the world we, we live in, giving back when we can, mentoring, understanding the tools that people need to be successful. Yeah. Um, and then also recognizing mental health as a major issue of twofold. Recognizing the things that we need to unlearn as minorities that have been taught to us that are negative from if you are a black person, an Asian person, or an, any other type of descent. Or, and also, as you try and move and succeed and grow in a space, there are a whole lot of people that are not there yet and that are going to be piece of shit ass humans mm -hmm. that you're going to still have to deal with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think recognizing all of those things are, is how you, you navigate the world and you, you try to do the best you can with, in the space we, we, we have. Um, and then the only thing we can control is like this room, this call, this is our community. A hundred percent. And I throw one additional thing in there and it's accountability Mm -hmm. Because I think that as much as we have to serve ourselves in our community and recognize that and stand up and keep speaking truth to power, we need to hold our white counterparts accountable because 
change can't happen without them. They they still play a part in this and making this happen. Um, and so I say keep speaking that truth to power. Keep, you know, challenging them. And that's part of the greater change, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, do you have anything to add? I think that Damon said everything. I, well, everybody said everything that I wanted to say, but Damon, m most of all, and then Tony, I would just argue that um, we don't need white people for anything. Uh, <laughs> I was yes, I for the policy. I, listen, for the policy. I, I, I understand. I, 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 I believe in, in, in actually, I, I, I hear you, but I also raise you a, a spade because <laughs> I think that it shouldn't just fall on us squarely. Like they need to actually basically be accountable and do their part as well. To like me, I think we can do it without them, but yeah. I think that we, I think they, they are a lot of white people are the people that are in power. So if they're the policy makers, if they're like, we need them to recognize and hear us. To me, right. that's like, a, so, go Jonathan. Uh, so I was just going to say, yes, I, yes. And, for our own solidarity, our own unity, our own alliance, um, I need both sides to understand very specific things about each other that I think Damon just mentioned in terms of, you know, seeing each other um, in these spaces and um, just knowing more. So, like Asian folks, I need you to know that like Black folks have been in the United States. If we're if we're limiting this to a United States context, that the Black folks have been here since 1619, that it has been an ongoing battle, that since slavery stopped, the government has not stopped in trying to replace slavery with various laws throughout the centuries, quite literally, policies that have subjugated or put Black folks, the boot on Black folks' neck to this day. At the same time, I need Black folks to understand that Asian is not really a thing. Asian is a white invention to mean everything east of us in Europe. So there are, what, Will help me or Stephen help me, like, what, 200 countries in Asia? That everybody is different and that they have their own infighting and that there are conflicts that have happened, much to the fault of the United States, may I add, that cause folks to come over here in the first place, right? Mm. Like there's a lot of drama there. So we need to be able to see each other um, more succinctly. Um, and that's the way we're going to form alliance. That's the way we're going to form solidarity. And that's the way we're going to move forward. So in other words, the United States, we're the drama. Are we the drama? <laughs> are we the drama? I think Absolutely. We, we might be the drama. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so let's just close here um, for our guest. Obviously, a lot of the last year, we, we just had an episode um, a, a few weeks ago about a year later, looking back on the Black Lives Matter movement. What are the key successes? What are the things that we're still working on? Um, if white people put down there, how to be an anti-racist book. So in hindsight, what would you all say are some of the key successes and then the continued work that needs to happen around um, the Asian Stop, excuse me, Asian Americans in America. Excuse me, Asians in America. Uh, let's start with Will. What was the question again? Sorry. Key successes and um, continued needs in the Stop Asian Hate movement. <sighs> successes, man. I don't know. I don't know what the successes really have been, I, except being able to unite a very broad, diverse like community uh, based across uh, uh, the violence that we've been facing um, because we have shared physical features. And um, I think uh, what we're starting to see is the exposure and the teaching of Asian American history, uh, our history in our country. And when I first saw the PBS miniseries, it was like a five hour miniseries called Asian Americans. It was the first time I learned about our history in our country. And uh, I can understand why people who don't know anything about us uh, would treat us as these perpetual foreigners in our own country. So um, I wanna see more of that. I wanna see more education. Mm -hmm. um, I wanna see more support of each other and that's only going to come through by working together and uh in various ways and you know not just like kind of social justice but you know entrepreneurial ways um uh 
working together and you know in any capacity would be great thank you uh steven yeah uh success is coming out of it like will said just bringing a very diverse group together uh, to help identify the pains, the injustices that people were feeling uh, spurring out of the violence from the COVID pandemic that's affected all of us. Um, I mean, the, the sad part is it's still continuing to this day, um, a lot of the violence, atrocities. Uh, but one of the other successes was I think it helped us to build solidarity with other communities, uh, especially the Black communities, to figure out how we can work together uh, in many different contexts and lenses. And what I do appreciate uh, and I want to see more of are projects uh, coming out that help unite uh, different marginalized communities, BIPOC communities together. Uh, Jonathan has done an awesome, awesome job creating a very thriving uh, Facebook community, bringing together Black and Asian communities. I want to see not just between Black and Asian, but between different BIPOC communities mm -hmm. moving into the future and hopefully using the pain to help accelerate ways that we can help each other heal and move forward. Thank you. And Jonathan? Uh, you know, both Stephen and Will hit the nail on the head, uh, and I want to piggyback off of what Will said and bring, uh, you know, my Tunis into it, child. I'm drunk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Listen, but here it is. We are, we are, we are, we are under your tutelage tonight. <laughs> so just, just let us just speak to the people. <laughs> speak to the people. Here it is: the unadulterated truth. Black folks, the reason why we have the respect that we're getting and that we, and we still have a, a road to go is because we know our history. It's because we're able to cite the bullshit and we're able to tell people this is how long we've been here and this is what we've had to go through and this is what we have done, not only for ourselves, but for other communities. Frederick Douglass in the late 1800s was one of the main voices against the Chinese Exclusion Act. That was Black and Asian solidarity right there, all the way back in 1880-something, before mm. slavery was even over. Come, come on. Um, and then the Civil Rights Movement, uh, the Immigration Act of 1965, allowed people like my mom and grandma's generation to come over here and have me create it. Where would you all be without me? No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is... What Will said earlier about watching the Asian Americans and being like, this is the first time I've ever heard. I need Asian Americans to be able to do slam poetry about their own history and and cut folks off when they try to say something. Because you know what that makes space for when you don't know your own history? It makes space for people to play into the model minority myth. And yes, a lot of Asian people do play into the model minority myth. We also know on the Black side that certain people Play, and I don't know if we're allowed to say this word on here, so I'm not going to say it, but we know the word for Black people who play into also a white minor, uh, minority myth, and they kind of just play on the white side. And it's like Uncle they, Tom. They, we can thank say you. it. Oh, Uncle Tom. So, we, so I thought you were talking about nigga. I say that too. <laughs> <laughs> we know that exists. And so, you know, if... If, for, if anybody has been listening to this and they don't really know what the model minority myth is and people who play into it, basically Asian Uncle Toms. Mm. As a matter of fact, um, Malcolm X called them that. Well, he, he used a different word that we definitely can't say on here because, you know, but um, look it up. So don't get us know canceled. Your history. <laughs> right. Uh, know your history. We need to know our histories and we need to be able to cut folks off when they're they're not telling the truth about Asians. When, when we do that then you'll start to see the same gains, the same returns as how black people have been getting off of their work for 400 years. Well, Jonathan, Stephen, Will, I say on behalf of Damon, Jordan, and I that we are really appreciative of you guys for taking the time. You know, time is money and time is valuable. And you took the time to sit with us today to have this really important conversation. And that, that means a lot to us. And on behalf of Surface Level, um, we want to thank you. And let's end on this note because we did promise the people in the beginning that we would come back to 
where they can find you. And so for each of you, I would like you to just let people know. And if you need to spell it, because sometimes it's hard to like, you know, give the, the social media media handle and actually look it up without knowing how to spell it, just do that. So Jonathan, let's start with you. Can you let people know where they can find you if they want to engage in more conversation, Child. whatever it may be? <laughs> <laughs> you had to do me first, and I just did a whole name change because of some crazy black Asian stuff. But um, <laughs> so uh, all over the internet, I'm Jonasan, which is the Japanese pronunciation of my name. So it's J O N A H S A H N. Jonasan, Jonathan. Okay. TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, all of them. Wait, what happened to Blasian FMA? Child, the, no, the, the not... folks were mad that I was saying Blasian, and <laughs> I almost... Go on. Did well, you almost get right. <laughs> because of that? No! <laughs> 2008, I've had that name. And now everybody is like, why you gotta let everybody know you're Blasian? <laughs> Period. But they, 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 they won, they won, they got you to change. Oh no. No, no, no. I, I won because now I don't have to entertain their bullshit. Period. <laughs> <laughs> so, Will, Will, let's go. Let's go to you next. Yeah, uh, I'm Will Lexham. Uh, that's W I triple L E X H A M. Uh, it's across all the socials. Okay, and Stephen, we're gonna we're gonna end with you because you have that that bedroom voice <laughs> <laughs> that we like around here, and that's and that's the, the one that's gonna take us on those, out. Those, and, pur and those purple lights. People in the will back. people are really gonna be looking at me, your name because it's giving <laughs> ASRM. <laughs> but it's giving very much of like I'm gonna play. He's telling me a bedtime story, and I'm living. <laughs> Let's get into it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can find me on social at Stephen Wakabayashi, W-A-K-A-B-A-Y-A-S-H-I. I also host my podcast, which is called Yellow Glitter, which centers around queer Asian perspectives. And you can find that in your various podcast channels as well. All right. If you want to hear more of that voice, you know where to go. Yellow, <laughs> Yellow Glitter. glitter. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you all, and that is all the time we have this week. This season of Surface Level is produced in partnership with Moby, mobilizing our brother's initiative. If you've enjoyed this episode, let's keep the conversation going. Let us know your thoughts and questions at surfacelevelpodcast.com. And remember, stay curious. <laughs>